Chapter Two of the Gold Sickle. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Gold Sickle by Eugene Sue, translated by Daniel De Leon. Chapter Two. A Gallic Homestead. Like all other rural homes, Joel's was spacious and round of shape. The walls consisted of two rows of hurdles, the space between which was filled with a mixture of beaten clay and straw. The inside and outside of the thick wall was plastered over with a layer of fine and fattish earth, which, when dry, was hard as sandstone. The roofing was large and projecting. It consisted of oaken joists joined together and covered with a layer of seaweed laid so thick that it was proof against water on either side of the house stood the barns destined for the storage of the harvest and also for the stables the sheepfolds the kennels the storerooms and the washrooms these several structures formed an oblong square that surrounded a large yard closed up at night with a massive gate on the outside a strong palisade raised on the brow of a deep ditch enclosed the system of buildings leaving between it and them an alley of about four feet wide two large and ferocious war mastiffs were let loose during the night in the vacant space the palisade had an exterior door that corresponded with an interior one all were locked at night the number of men women and children all more or less near relatives of joel who cultivated fields in common with him was considerable these lodged in the houses attached to the principal building where they met at noon and in the evening to take their joint meals other homesteads similarly constructed and occupied by numerous families who cultivated lands in common lay scattered here and there over the landscape and composed the Ligny or tribe of Karnak, of which Joel was chosen chief. Upon his entrance in the yard of his homestead, Joel was received with the caresses of his old war dog, Deborah Trud, an animal of an iron gray color, streaked with black, an enormous head, bloodshot eyes, and of such a high stature that in standing up to caress his master, he placed his front paws upon Joel's shoulders. He was a dog of such boldness that he once fought a monstrous bear of the mountains of Ares and killed him. As to his war qualities, Debertrud would have been worthy of figuring with the war pack of Bithert, the Gaelic chieftain who at the sight of a small hostile troop said disdainfully, They are not enough for a meal for my dogs. As Debertrud looked over and smelled the traveler with a doubtful air, Joel said to the animal, do you not see he is a guest whom I bring home? As if he understood the words, Devertrud ceased showing any uneasiness about the stranger, and gambled clumsily ahead of his master into the house. The house was partitioned into three sections of unequal size. The two smaller ones, separated from each other and from the main hall by oaken panels, were destined, one for Joel and his wife, the other for Hina, their daughter, when she came to visit the family, and the vast hall between the two served as a dining-room, and in it were performed the noon and evening indoor labors. When the stranger entered the hall, a large fire of beechwood enlivened with dry brushwood and seaweed burned in the hearth, with its brilliancy rendered superfluous the light of a handsome lamp of burnished copper that hung from three chains of the same metal. The lamp was a present from Michael, the armorer. Two whole sheep were impaled in long iron spits, broiled before the hearth, while salmon and other sea fish boiled in a large pewter pot filled with water, seasoned with vinegar, salt, and caraway. The panels were ornamented with heads of wolves, boars, serfs, and of two wild bulls called Uruk, an animal that began to be rare in the region. Beside them hung hunting weapons such as bows, arrows, and slings, and weapons of war such as the spar and the maytag, axes, sabers of copper, 
bucklers of wood covered with the tough skin of seals and long lances with iron heads sharpened and barbed and provided with little brass bells intended to notify the enemy from afar that the gallic warrior approached seeing that the latter disdains ambuscades and loves to fight in the open there were also fishing nets and harpoons to harpoon the salmon in the shallows when the tide goes out to the right of the main door stood a kind of altar consisting of a block of granite surmounted and covered by large oak branches freshly cut a little copper bowl lay on the stone in which seven twigs of mistletoe stood from above on the wall the following inscription looked down abundance and heaven are for the just and the pure he is pure and holy who performs celestial works and pure when joel stepped into the house he approached the copper basin in which stood the seven branches of mistletoe and reverently put his lips to each his guest followed his example and then both walked towards the hearth at the hearth was ma'am margaret joel's wife with a distaff she was tall of stature and wore a short sleeveless tunic of brown wool over a long robe of gray with narrow sleeves both tunic and robe being fastened around her waist with her apron string a white cap cut square left exposed her gray hair that parted over her forehead like many other women of her kin she wore a coral necklace round her neck bracelets inwrought with garnets and other trinkets of gold and silver fashioned at autumn around ma'am margaret played the children of gilhern and several other of her kin while their young mothers busied themselves preparing supper margaret said joel to his wife i bring a guest to you he is welcome answered the woman without stopping to spin the gods send us a guest our hearth is his own the eve of my daughter's birth is propitious may your children when they travel be received as i am by you answered the stranger respectfully but you do not yet know what kind of a guest the gods have sent us margarid rejoined joel such a guest as one would request of ogmi for the long autumn and winter nights a guest who in the course of his travels has seen so many curious things and wonderful that a hundred evenings would not be too many to listen to his marvelous stories hardly had joel pronounced these words when from ma'am margaret and the young mothers down to the little boys and girls all looked at the stranger with a greed of curiosity expectant of the marvelous stories he was to tell are we to have supper soon margaret asked joel our guest is probably as hungry as myself i am hungry as a wolf the folk have just gone out to fill the racks of the cattle answered margarid they will be back shortly if our guest is willing we shall be pleased of his company at supper i thank the wife of joel and shall wait said the unknown and while waiting remarked joel you can tell us a story but the traveller interrupted his host and said smiling friend as one cup serves for all so does the same story serve for all the cup will shortly circulate from lip to lip and the story from ear to ear but now tell me what is that brass belt for that i see hanging yonder have you not also in your country the belt of agility explain yourself joel here with us at every new moon the lads of each tribe come to the chief and try on the belt in order to prove that their girth has not broadened with self-indulgence and that they have preserved themselves agile and nimble those who cannot hitch the belt around themselves are hissed and pointed at with derision and must pay a fine accordingly all see to their stomachs lest they come to look like a leathern bottle on two skittles a good custom i regret it fell into disuse in my province and what is the purpose of that big old trunk it is of precious wood and seems to have seen many years very many that is the family trunk of triumph answered joel opening the trunk in which the stranger saw many whitened skulls one of them sawn in two was mounted on a brass foot like a cup these are no doubt the heads of enemies who have been killed by your father's friend joel with us this sort of family charnel houses has long been abandoned 
with us also i preserve these heads only out of respect for my ancestors since more than two hundred years the prisoners of war are no longer mutilated the habit existed in the days of the kings whom ritha gore shaved of their hair as you mentioned before to make himself a blouse out of their beards those were gay days of barbarism were those days of royalty i heard my grandfather curio say that even as late as in the days of his father tiras the men who went to war returned to their tribes carrying the heads of their enemies stuck to the points of their lances or trailed by the hair from the breastplates of their horses they were then nailed to the doors of the houses for trophies just as you see yonder on the wall the heads of wild animals with us in olden days friend joel these trophies were also preserved but preserved in cedar oil when they were the heads of hostile chieftains by Jesus, cedar oil what magnificence exclaimed joel smiling that is the way our wives reason for good fish good sauce these relics were with us as with you the book from which the young gaul learned of the exploits of his fathers often did the families of the vanquished offer to ransom these spoils but to relinquish for money a head conquered by oneself or an ancestor was looked upon as an unpardonable crime of avarice and impiousness i say with you those barbarous customs passed away with royalty and with them the days when our ancestors painted their bodies blue and scarlet and dyed their hair and beard with lime water to impart to them a copper red hue without wronging their memory friend guest our ancestors must have been unpleasant beings to look upon and must have resembled the frightful red and blue dragons that ornament the prows of the vessels of those savage pirates of the north that my son albinic the sailor and his lovely wife mero have told us some curious tales about but here are our men back from the stables we shall not have to wait much longer for supper i see margarid unspitting the lambs you shall taste them friend and see what a fine taste the salt meadows on which they browse impart to their flesh all the men of the family of joel who entered the hall wore like him a sleeveless blouse of coarse wool through which the sleeves of their jackets or white shirts were passed their breeches reached down to their ankles and they were shod with low slippers several of these laborers just in from the fields wore over their shoulders a cloak of sheepskin which they immediately took off all wore woolen caps long hair cut round and bushy beards the last two to enter held each other by the arm they were especially handsome and robust friend joel inquired the stranger who are those two young fellows the statues of the heathen god mars are not better shaped nor have so valiant an aspect they are two relatives of mine two cousins julian and armel they love each other like brothers quite recently an enraged bull rushed at armel and julian saved armel at the peril of his own life thanks to hesus we are not now in times of war but should it be necessary to take up arms julian and armel have taken the pledge of brotherhood but supper is ready come yours is the seat of honor joel and the unknown guest drew near the table it was round and raised somewhat above the floor which was covered with fresh straw all round the table were seats bolstered with fragrant grass the two broiled muttons now quartered were served up in large platters of beechwood white as ivory there were also large pieces of salted pork and a smoked ham of wild boar the fish remained in the large pot that they had been boiled in at the place where joel the head of the family took his seat stood a huge cup of plated copper that even two men could not have drained it was before that cup which marked the place of honor that the stranger was placed with joel at his left and ma'am margaret at his right the old men the young girls and the children then ranked themselves around the table the grown-up and the young men sat down behind these in a second row from which they rose from time to time to perform some service or every time that passing from hand to hand beginning with a stranger the large cup was empty to fill it from a barrel of hydromel that was placed at a corner of the hall furnished with a piece of barley or wheat bread every one received or took a slice of broiled or salted meat which he cut up with his knife or into which he bit freely 
without the help of a knife. The old war dog, Devotrud, enjoying the privileges of his age and long years of service, lay at the feet of Joel, who did not forget his faithful servitor. Towards the end of the meal, Joel, having carved the wild boar ham, detached the hoof, and following an ancient custom, said to his young relative Armel, handing it to him, To you, Armel, belongs the bravest part. To you, the vanquisher in last evening's fight. At the moment when, proud of being pronounced the bravest in the presence of the stranger, Armel was stretching out his hand to take the wild boar's hoof that Joel presented to him, an exceptionally short man in the family, nicknamed Stumpy, by reason of his small stature, observed aloud, Armel won in yesterday's fight because he was not fighting with Julian. Two bullocks of equal strength avoid and fear each other and do not lock horns. Feeling humiliated at hearing it said of them and before a stranger that they did not fight together because they were mutually afraid of each other, Julian and Armel grew red in the face. With sparkling eyes, Julian cried, If I did not fight with Armel, it was because someone else took my place. But Julian fears Armel as little as Armel fears Julian. And if you were but one inch taller, Stumpy, I would show you on the spot that beginning with you, I fear nobody, not even my good brother Armel. Good brother Julian, added Armel, whose eyes also began to glisten. We shall have to prove to the stranger that we do not fear each other. Done, Armel. Let's fight with sabers and bucklers. The two friends reached out their hands to each other and pressed them warmly. They entertained no rancor for each other. They loved each other as warmly as ever. The combat decided upon them was a not uncommon outbreak of foolhardiness. Joel was not sorry at seeing his kin act bravely before his guest, and his family shared his views. At the announcement of the battle, everybody present, even the little children and young women and girls, felt joyful. They clapped their hands, smiling, and looked at each other proud of the good opinion that the unknown visitor was to form of the courage of their family. Ma'am Margaret thereupon addressed the young men. The fight ends the moment I lower my distaff. These children are feasting you at their best, friend guest, said Joel to the stranger. You will in turn have to feast them by telling them and all of us some of the marvelous things that you have seen in your travels. I could not do else than pay in my best coin for your hospitality, friend, answered the stranger. I shall tell you the stories. Let's hurry, brother Julian, said Armel. I have a strong desire to hear the traveler. I can never get tired of listening to stories, but the storytellers are rare around Karnak. You see, friend, said Joel, with what impatience your stories are awaited, but before starting, and so as to give you strength, you shall presently drink to the victor with good wine of Gaul. And turning to his son, Gilhern, fetch in the little keg of white wine from Bezier's that your brother Albinic brought us on his last trip. Fill up the cup in honor of the traveler. When that was done, Joel said to Julian and Armel, Now, boys, fall to with your sabers. End of chapter 2